Good afternoon, Tag Nation. Welcome to our very first webinar for our 2016 Webinar Wednesday series. Tech Nation is focused on giving back to the HTM community. So let's kick off our third year of Webinar Wednesdays by giving away a Tech Nation pullover to the attendees that can tell us which two states are going to host the 2016 MD Expos. Use the question feature on your webinar dashboard to answer right now. While you are answering, I want to remind you all that this webinar is eligible for one CE credit from the ACI. To obtain your certification of attendance, you must complete the post-webinar survey which will appear immediately on your computer screen at the end of today's call. If you do not receive the survey, you can email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. And it looks like we have some answers coming in right now. We've got uh, some gr Obviously, we've done a good job of telling everyone where the spring show is, but not so much. Oh, we got a winner. Looks like Richard Sable. Richard Sable, congratulations. We're going to give you a Tech Nation pullover. We will reach out to you about what size you need. All right, Tech Nation would like to thank our sponsor today, Kronk Technologies. Kronk Technologies provides innovative products to refine and streamline the biomedical maintenance and support process. They design and manufacture specialized diagnostic tools, and their innovative designs have been granted 17 patents worldwide. Learn more at kronktech.com. Our presenter, Greg Alkire, has spent the last 22 plus years in the medical device industry in a wide range of roles from medical device manufacturing, service, quality, regulatory assurance, operations, and sales. Currently, his responsibilities include worldwide sales and marketing for all Prompt Technologies products, as well as an active role in the research and development of new products. Greg, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you, John, and uh, thank you to MD Publishing and Tech Nation for providing this forum for uh, helping the healthcare technology industry in terms of getting us connected and, and sharing information. So today's presentation is going to be all about the question of uh, is the medical device really ready to go back to the clinical department? And as those of you that have seen our presentations in the past know, this is not going to be a sales pitch about Kronk Technologies products. We work very hard to make the information that we provide uh, educational and hopefully everybody on the call and the uh, webinar will find something useful in our presentation. That's our primary goal when we do these, these things. So getting started, as an overview, during the discussion we're going to help to uncover tools for decoding specification terminology. Uh, the fact is that uh, just looking at the different ways different companies specify accuracy on devices, you could spend two hours trying to understand all the different terms used, but we won't do that. Uh, we're also going to try to untangle medical device accuracy, accuracy specs from requirements for test equipment by those medical device manufacturers. We're going to do a step-by-step -step review of how to determine what accuracy is required when testing those specific medical devices. We're also going to look at how to choose test equipment that meets the manufacturer requirements and try to understand better other potential errors that can also impact the medical device readiness. When we first started thinking about doing this topic for a webinar, uh, we tried to organize all the different pieces, different elements that um, you would review in order to figure out what is the appropriate test equipment for a medical device as well as what calibration process would be necessary and we we went holy cow there's a lot of pieces involved uh, not only do you have all the different specifications and requirements from the medical device but you've got different aspects of the test equipment that you have to look at as well as the calibration process as a manufacturer of test equipment ourselves, we deal with the test equipment and the calibration processes every day. And we've gotten better at looking at uh, medical device specs and how they relate back to the test equipment as well as the calibration process. Um, but it's become very obvious that this would be incredibly challenging for biomeds because you've got even more to deal with. You've almost got three different languages in terms of the way the test, the uh, specifications are written as well. So let's start with uh, the decoding the terminology. The terminology 
focus here is going to be on the test equipment terminology, although it does translate at times to the way the, the specifications are written for medical devices as well. So we're going to cover terms like uncertainty, tolerance, plus or minus one LSD, for example. What does resolution mean? Four to one ratio, accuracy percent of reading, full scale, range, um, as well as uh, an example of a, a scale uh, specification sheet. Hopefully by the end of this, um, a lot of this will make more sense to you. So starting off with the different terminology used in specifications, um, if you talk to a metrology or calibration lab, they typically refer to it as uncertainty of the measurement or the calculated maximum error. Uh, in our industry, you generally see the term accuracy used in place of the term uncertainty. But if you think about it, the term accuracy is often used instead of uncertainty, but the specs may be stated as accuracy, 1% of FS plus or minus 1 LSD. So the accuracy stated is 1%, but that doesn't mean that the device is 99% inaccurate. Um, it's actually, to, to state it properly, you would say that the uncertainty is 1%. But for the sake of this webinar, I'm not going to try to convert everybody into stating uncertainty. We're going to try to stick with the term accuracy because that's what you'll find when you dig into specification sheets for both medical devices and test equipment. Forgive me if I slip. I may still use the word uncertainty. So we've got a survey question for you here, and uh, we're very curious if you're familiar with the difference between an accuracy specified as an accuracy of full scale. Absolutely, Greg. Right now the attendees are able to see the question, are you familiar with the difference between an accuracy specified as percentage of FS and percentage of reading? We would prefer that you select one answer, yes or no. We still have a few moments here for you to get your vote in. And while we're waiting, I want to remind everyone, during the presentation today, you're able to submit questions using your question feature or the chat feature on your dashboard. All questions will be held to the end of the webinar, where Greg will address it we have time for. Let's go ahead and see the results from our poll. Looks like 38% of the audience is familiar while 62% would not be familiar with the difference. Greg, whenever you're ready, you can pick up the presentation. All right. So getting back to the presentation, more terminology to be familiar with. Um, tolerance is specified allowable error or the min-max allowable error in a test process. Resolution can mean a couple different things. Uh, the smallest unit of measure that can be displayed, but it can be different in terms of the resolution of measurement. So resolution generally means the smallest unit of measure that can be displayed. The plus or minus X LSD, those are specified as an additional uncertainty beyond the published percent accuracy. Uh, LSD is the least significant digit of the displayed resolution. And we've got an example here so you can see how it relates. If you've got a digital pressure meter, that specified accuracy is 0.5% of reading, plus or minus one LSD. What you would do in this case is you take the percent accuracy and add one LSD. To determine the LSD, you would look at the resolution of the display which is 0.01 in this case. So if your test point is 10 PSI and you want to determine the accuracy of the tester at that test point, you would take 10 PSI and multiply it times the percent accuracy of 0.5%, which equals 0.05 PSI, and then add the least significant digit to that number, giving you a total accuracy of 0.06 PSI. 
So just to summarize, once you calculate the percent uncertainty, you then need to add the additional uncertainty of the LSD stated and by taking the resolution of the device and multiplying it by the least significant significant digit, you'll get the total uncertainty or accuracy. Four to one ratio, what's that all about? So what we're talking about there is the comparison between the accuracy of the unit under test and the estimated calibration uncertainty uh, as known as the test uncertainty ratio. Four to one ratio is used typically to establish a chain of comparison. The standard that's used during the testing must be at least four times more accurate than the instrument being calibrated. Notice calibrated is in bold there. That's, it's much more critical to have a four to one ratio when you're dealing with calibration processes. Each laboratory in the chain is at least four times more accurate in its measurement than the previous laboratory. And again, it's much more critical when you're calibrating devices to have that four to one relationship. So if we take this example, if the medical device is specified at 4% accuracy, uh, the biomed test tool ideally is uh, got an accuracy specification of 1%. The Secondary lab that's doing the calibration for the biomed is at a quarter percent, and then it traces all the way back to NIST standards. So you can see that at each level you get much more uptight about the tolerances that you can have when you're calibrating. With that four to one ratio through calibration, traceability can be achieved back to NIST standards. Even if you don't have a four to one ratio between your test equipment and the medical device, you should identify what your ratio is and how much that potential error could influence the readiness of that device going back to the clinical department. All right, so we're going to talk, we're going to do a couple of examples of the different accuracy percent uh, stated specifications. In this case, we're looking at an example of accuracy percent of reading. And we'll show you how that works. It's basically the percentage is applied across the entire range of the tester. At, so any test point, you would just take that percentage and, and multiply. So here we've got an example where the accuracy is stated at 0.5% of reading. And when it's stated as percent of reading, range does not impact the accuracy, regardless of the test point. If the test point is 10, you would take that 0.5%, multiply it times 10, and know that your accuracy at that test point is 0 0.05. When specifications are stated as, per as percent accuracy and do not specify reading or full scale, for example, you can't assume anything. You should contact the manufacturer to verify. Now, Accuracy as a percent of FS, which means full scale, you'll see that that's a very different translation. Uh, the accuracy percentage is based on the maximum range of the device. To determine its uncertainty, uh, I told you I'd slip, or accuracy, take the full scale and multiply it by the accuracy percent specified. Sounds confusing, I know. Um, so the accuracy stated for this example is 1% of FS and the device has a range specified from 0 to 45. So you take the full scale, which is 45, and you take the percentage specified of 1%, multiply it times 45, and you have a 0.45 accuracy or tolerance. That um, 0.45 could be PSI, it could be something else. But if the test point is 10, that 0.45 still applies at that test point as well. So you end up with, if you want to see what the percent accuracy is at a test point, you take that 0.45 potential error, divide it by the test point, and you'll get your percentage accuracy. In this case, it's 4.5%. A different example, the accuracy is stated as 1% of full scale, and the range actually goes negative and positive. It's a little different. So the full scale is not 75, it's 85, because you've got 10 on one side and 75 on the other. So again, you take the percent accuracy stated times 
the full scale number of 85, you get 0.85% or 0.85 accuracy. But if the test point again is 10, then you have to divide 0.85 by the test point value of 10 and you end up with an 8.5% accuracy. Neither one of those provide you with what you might expect, which would be a 1% accuracy at 10 PSI. I've been doing electronics, I've been electronics tech since the mid 80s, and I didn't learn this, this caveat until about six years ago myself. Uh, what about accuracy stated as a percent of range? It's a little different from percent full scale, um, but it's a very similar formula. So to determine the range, they'll either specify the accuracy percent of range and then state a range, or if it's a plus or minus range, you would just use the plus or the minus depending on how you're testing. So in this case, the accuracy is stated as 2% of range, and we've found in the specs that the range is plus or minus 200. So we're going to use 200 as the range. Uh, so 2% times 200 equals 4% or 4 units. But if the test point again is 10, look what happens to your accuracy or uncertainty. You divide 4 divided by the test point of 10 and you have a 40% accuracy with that tester at that test point. This is a sample spec sheet of a scale. Uh, these days there's some IV pump companies that are calling out use this scale or equivalent and it's a little bit, it's a whole different language than what we've been talking about. They're not specified in terms of accuracy as a percent. Um, I've never seen one that's specified that way. What they do provide you with is two or three uncertainties to use in terms of determining the accuracy. So here we've got nonlinearity of 0 0.02 and repeatability of 0 0.01. You would actually add these two together and you'd end up with 0 0.03 uncertainty. Now, that uncertainty or accuracy of the scale does not take into account all of the issues you would encounter with fluid dynamics, such as drift, draft, drops, evaporation, and all the uh, different impacts of uh, trying to test fluid onto a scale. Scales are specified based on putting a hard weight on them, and that's how they're tested, and that's how they're designed. So there's fluid dynamics that add to that uncertainty or accuracy that are not accounted for in the spec sheet, of course. So now that we're done with some of that terminology, um, let's figure out how we can sort all this out and make it meaningful for choosing the right tester. So the way we've laid this out is a five-step process. Um, first thing to look at would be the medical device user specifications. Those are typically um, what the nurses are looking at or the doctors in terms of how they can expect the medical device to operate when used with a patient. You've got step two where you're looking at the medical device service specifications, which can be very different from the user specifications, um, as well as the test points and tolerances in the service documentation. Step three would be to establish a minimum accuracy needed from the test equipment based on what you learned from the medical device documentation. Step four would be to identify test equipment accuracy at the service test points um, and make sure you untangle whether it's percent of reading or percent of full scale as an example. Step five would be to determine finally if the test equipment meets the minimum accuracy needed based on what the medical device and the, and the manufacturer has specified. So, uh, we're going to look at medical device accuracy specifications versus accuracy requirements for test equipment. So we're going to do step one first, which was to look at the, the medical device manufacturer specifications for users. In this case, we're using the CareFusion Alaris 8100 model as an example. 
in the user manual for the nurses, the accuracy is specified as plus or minus 5%. And we're talking about rate slash volume in this case. So the second step we talked about was looking at the service documentation for the medical device. And in this case, the service manual calls out uh, an A and B HD-120 scale or equivalent. And I pasted in there those three relevant specs for that scale. Uh, the service manual test point is 12 milliliters uh, of volume. And the test point tolerance in the service manual for that test point is basically 3.4% or plus or minus 0.48 milliliters, which is different from the user manual spec. It's tighter. Uh, I have learned that one of the reasons that is a tighter tolerance than the user manual accuracy stated is so that when you're doing testing or calibration of the pump, you know you're dealing with variability from one IV set to another and even loading the IV set multiple times. And so they didn't want that additional error to be introduced into the test process without compensating for it. So step three is to determine what test equipment, what the test equipment needs are for that medical device. And if you use the four to one ratio for this case model, you would be looking at your tolerance from the manufacturer is 0 0.408. If you divide that by four, you, you need a tester that has a specified accuracy that provides plus or minus 0 0.102 milliliters. Or if you do percentages, it'd be 3.4% divided by four or 0.85% accuracy from your tester. So we're going to have a couple of different uh, testers for this case model. We're going to look at one, uh, both of them are stated accuracy as a percent of reading. Um, one is specified accuracy of 0.85% of reading. The other is 2% of reading. And to calculate the uncertainty or accuracy in units, you would take the percentage accuracy stated. Um, you would multiply that times the test point value of 12 and then add the least significant digit if there is one stated in the specification for the tester. So in this case, if you look at the two different testers and the two different specifications, you get a total, a, an endpoint accuracy of plus or minus 102, 0.102 for analyzer A and for analyzer B, you'd be at 0 0.250. So basically you multiply the percent accuracy times the test point and add the least significant digit if it's stated. Now from there, you can compare the medical device tolerances for testing to the different test equipment available for the test process. And in this case, analyzer A, as we talked about, had a plus or minus 0.102. Analyzer B was 0.250. And then you can determine what the ratio is between the medical device and the test equipment. Analyzer A was a 4 to 1 relationship. Analyzer B was a 2 to 1 relationship. So let's take a look at another example where a tester is stated as accuracy percent of reading, and a different one is stated as accuracy percent of full scale. As we look at this, we've got analyzer A and analyzer B. Analyzer A is, this is for uh, a test of pressure, by the way, sorry. So analyzer A has a range of 75 PSI. The accuracy specification is stated as half a percent of reading. And analyzer B is stated as 1% FX. And remember, that's full scale. So as we look at those specs and, and and translate them, at least at full scale, we can determine the uncertainty or accuracy of the device. For analyzer A, because it's percent of reading, you multiply the percent times the test point, or the full scale in this case, and you get a 0.385. And with analyzer B, you end up with a 0.46. That's the accuracy full scale. They're, they're pretty similar so far. 
But watch what happens when you look at it at the particular test point you want. At 10 PSI test point, it changes dramatically. The device that's spec at full scale ends up being a 4.6% device. The, the accuracy of the device that's stated as a percent of reading is 0.6%. So very different now that we're looking at an actual test point and the uncertainty or accuracy of those two testers at, after doing the math. So let's look at 5 PSI now, and of course that's twice as bad um, for the full scale device. The, the device that was stated as a percent of reading is still staying very tight as a percent, but the device that's stated as a percent of full scale has gone up to a 9.2 percent uncertainty or accuracy. So the way you calculate that, if it's full scale, again, you divide the accuracy units by the test point units and then add the least significant digit and you'll have a percent accuracy at the test point. It's much easier if it's stated as percent of reading. You simply multiply that percentage times the test point and add the least significant digit if it's stated. Hopefully that made sense. So a different example and three scenarios. Um, let's take some of that that we've learned and apply it to some example testing of an infusion pump. In scenario one, um, we're pretending as if the IV pump is out of tolerance for volume, and we're using the, the same two testers. Tester A has that four to one ratio, tester B has a two to one ratio compared to the IV pump test tolerance. As we go across here, we're going to do a 12 milliliter volume test, and we're going to calculate the percent of error potential for the two different testers. In this case, the IV pump is performing 5% high, so it's, it should be failing our test because the test tolerance in the case of the care fusion model is 3.4%. So let's say that tester A is measuring low at its limit of 0.85%. The result would be 12.49 and would be a fail based on the manufacturer of the medical device's min-max. So that's a good thing. The, the pump should be failing the test. The, the test tolerance is 3.4. But if we use the 2 to 1 tester if, and it is at the lower end of its spec of minus 2%. The result comes out at 12.35, even though the real reading should be 12.6. And we're actually now passing that, that IV pump, even though it's in reality out of tolerance. So we just passed a failing device. In a different test for that same pump, we may be testing for occlusion pressure um, in this case, the tolerance is really wide in terms of the test tolerance from the manufacturer. The, the test point tolerance for the IV pump is actually 25%. So you've got quite a window there to pass. Um, in the extreme case, um, if the pump was high by 35%, uh, tester A was measuring at its lower limit or pressure at minus half a percent, um, you would still see a failure in your test process, so no harm there. And the same goes for tester B, because tester B for pressure and a five to one ratio against the manufactured test tolerance. So basically it's got a potential error of minus 4.6, it still did not pass our test, so that's okay, and that kind of clears up the issue of the 4 to 1 being better than the 2 to 1. Um, you can see that if you have 4 to 1 or better ratio, you're less likely to fail or to pass a failing device, which is the worst case scenario. But if we're not doing an occlusion test and we're actually doing an occlusion calibration on an IV pump, it gets harder because if we're using that same device for calibration, We've got a much tighter tolerance, as you would expect, for doing a calibration of a 
pressure transducer on an infusion pump. In this case, the manufacturer is looking for you to introduce 10 PSI into the system and then using their software actually adjust the calibration of the pump. If you're using tester A, which has a tolerance of 0.5%, um, then you have a worst case error of 9.95 um, versus the target of 9.8 to 10.2. So you're well within that min max limit of the calibration test. So that's a good test and that's a good calibration. But with tester B being a 4.6% device, you're potentially calibrating it incorrectly because you're reading 9.54, but the system thinks you're at 10, and you're potentially miscalibrating the device. So the, the point here is that doing a test or a performance test of a device uh, is much different from doing a calibration of a device. The typically manufacturers of medical devices are much more uptight about the calibration process. It's noteworthy that most of the manufacturer service documentation I've seen does not call out for different test equipment if you're just doing a PM versus a calibration. Um, they call out a particular tester or, or test standards, but they don't specify different testers for different service processes. A different example in a different medical device. So here we're going to look at ventilator, a specific ventilator in the test process versus a couple of different vent testers. One um, is specified as percent of reading, which we know is much easier to calculate. The other actually is percent of range as well. So in this case, we're looking at a Philips Restoronics B200 uh, ventilator. We've listed some of the test points that were called out in the actual service manual. So 50 liters per minute up to 165 liters per minute. These are test points called out in the service manual. We looked at the user manual accuracy specification and saw that it was 10%. We are doing a flow test here, so that's the test we're doing. The service manual tolerance, plus or minus liters per minute, is stated here. And then we did our our step of looking at what would the, the 4 to 1 tolerance be if we wanted to maintain that 4 to 1 relationship between the tester and the actual medical device. So let's do a tester comparison here. Vent tester A is specified as 3% of reading or 2% of range. Um, so that adds another layer of complexity when you're trying to figure out the test equipment specifications. Well, which one do you use? Do you use 3% of reading or 2% of range? But it turns out that if you talk to the calibration or metrology companies, that when you read a specification that way, the, the way to read it is whichever is worse. So in this case, we're going to look at both and see which one is worse depending on what test point we're at. So tester A, if we looked at it as a percent of reading, tolerance, there is your potential error of the tester. Uh, at test point of 50, your, your potential uh, uncertainty would be 1.5 plus or minus 1.5 and on down the line. If you look at it as a 2% of range, as it's also specified, it's constantly 4. So it would be plus or minus 4 liters per minute. So there's actually a, a crossover that happens here, which is why they say or. Um, if you're using the worst of the two, depending on the test point, you'd, be, you'd want to use this four until you reached the test point of 165, where the actual 3% of reading is the worst, and then you have to use that. And in, in most of these cases, you're not getting a four to one relationship between the tester and the ventilator. You can see here that the target was 1.25, and this is at four because you're using the worst of the two. And here you're looking for a, a uncertainty of three, and you've got 3.6 or four, so it doesn't work out to be four to one. Vent tester B has a specification of 2% of reading, which makes it easier to translate. 
And so 2% of reading happens to work out well for maintaining that 4 to 1 relationship. Here we're at 1.00. Uh, the requirement was 1.25. And on down the line, every one of these test points, we've got that 4 to 1 relationship. So one other survey question for you. We're curious uh, if you're currently reviewing both medical device and specifications before selecting your test. All right, Greg, you're right. The attendees right now are able to see the question and submit their votes. Again, the question is, are you currently reviewing both medical device specs and test equipment specifications before selecting a tester? Please select either yes or no. While you're getting your answers in, I do want to remind you we're going to have a Q&A at the end of today's call. Please feel welcome to submit your questions anytime during the presentation. And a webinar workbook was sent out prior to today. Uh, if you're looking for that VIP pass for the MD Expo with the promo code from Print Proc Technologies, you can find the handout in the handout feature of your dashboard. It's a PDF that you can download. All right, let's get our results. Greg, it looks like 47% of the audience answered yes, while 53% of the audience said no. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> moving on. Um, so what if the test equipment doesn't meet the manufacturer requirements? Um, a good question to ask is, does it at least meet the 4 to 1 ratio? Because you can have a greater confidence that at least when you're returning it to the clinical department that it, um, it should be passing all of its manufacturer specifications if you've got that 4 to 1 ratio. Another question is, are, are you performing an actual calibration of the device or only doing a check a performance test or a PM? Um, calibration can be much more critical in terms of making sure that the medical device is passing all of its specifications versus doing a performance test. Of course, if you're doing a performance test with a device that, with a tester that is not at least four to one or, or at least more accurate than the device you're testing, how do you know it's really passing before you return it to the clinical department? You'd want to assess the potential risk and likelihood of something going wrong with um, the clinical department if it's not meeting the manufacturer requirements. And then the interesting, I was speaking with one of the former directors of the major health system about this topic, and um, he gave me some examples of where he had tightened the tolerance for passing the, or failing the medical device based on not having that four to one relationship between the tester and the medical device. Um, so you Basically, what we're talking about there, if you don't have four to one and you're concerned about passing a device that may be out of tolerance, you could subtract the accuracy percent of the tester from the accuracy percent of the, med of the medical device and have uh, much greater confidence that you're not passing something that should be failing. The downside to that is you would, you would potentially be failing medical devices that are actually passing. But if you got in a pinch and you were concerned about passing a medical device back to the clinical folks that could be failing because of your tester accuracy, you could take this approach. I hadn't considered this approach before uh, speaking to that, that director, but uh, it makes sense. And we did a big spreadsheet we're not going to bore you with where it actually works. So some other potential errors that involved with test equipment, um, certainly setup errors can have a big impact on the test results, enough to cause the medical devices to even be outside their specifications, and especially if you're calibrating them. Also, test equipment may have caveats in their specifications that you got to pay attention to that could impact the accuracy of the test results as well. An example of a setup error that could have a big impact on the accuracy of your overall test system um, is infusion pumps. 
more and more I'm seeing that the IV pump manufacturers are very, becoming very finicky about the height of the fluid in the IV bag under the test setup. Um, two of the major IV pump companies on the market actually specify within an inch or two where that fluid height has to be. So I looked into and researched and talked to the IV pump companies about why that was becoming so uptight. And it turns out that if the fluid height is not as specified for the service or calibration, you can have an influence of up to 1% to 3%, um, depending on what your height is. So if the fluid height is not at, in this example, 20 inches, and let's say it's at 10 inches, you could see a 1% to 3% reduction in the pump output just from having that height off by 10 inches. Now the tester uh, collection container analyzer scale height actually makes a big difference too but it's about half the influence of the source water. If the tester for example is 12 inches above the pump mechanism you get a half percent reduction in pump output and the reverse of both of these is true as well. If the height of the fluid source fluid is too high you'll get a, a, a large, a, an increase in your pump output. And if the tester is too low, uh, you'll see an increase as well. Basically, the, the software and the mechanism of the infusion pump is counting on specific heights. And height in fluid is pressure. So they're, the engineers are counting on a specific height, both in terms of the source and, and the and the collection container for calibration and service. Um, there is a solution out on the market now for controlling that height with a very little fuss, and uh, it's almost automatic if, if you're interested. So why the heck does test fluid height at 20 inches really that important if nursing don't, doesn't pay attention to the height? of the IV bag when they're delivering meds. One reason, uh, the manufacturer is counting on controlled conditions during the test and calibration processes to reduce the errors when the device is returned to the clinical environment where it's much less controlled. And it's not that different from testing alarms on any medical device. We know that nurses can turn off alarms and turn them down, but we still test to make sure that the alarms are functioning and functioning correctly. So a potential setup error with a pressure meter that um, might be interesting if you do not zero a pressure meter properly to atmosphere, you can introduce a lot of error into your pressure reading. Um, speak to your test equipment manufacturer about that topic if, you, if you're looking to find out more or you may find it in their user manual as well. Some pressure meters even have a zero offset error that's specified in their accuracy. For example, Accuracy is 1% of range, plus or minus 5 millimeters mercury, zero offset error. So that's got to be accounted for in the total uncertainty of the tester. The zero offset error must be factored in. So what to watch out for in terms of test equipment and medical devices. Uh, NIS key traceable calibration of your test equipment. We know that some of the um, accreditation companies are looking for NISC traceability in your documentation. Understand whether your calibration lab has a certified quality system, which can make a big difference in terms of their, their consistency of their performance and whether they utilize a 4 to 1 uncertainty ratio or better when calibrating your equipment. Ensure your calibration lab is informing you on the CalCert if your test device was found to be outside its published tolerances. Uh, your CalCert should state as found and as left in terms of what the performance was. And it can be very important if they found that it was out of specification when it was received by them. Definitely keep an eye out for percent of full scale or per percent of range in terms of accuracy specs. Um, we now know that percent of reading is much more straightforward to calculate the uncertainty versus um, percent of full scale. Watch out for rate or flow dependent accuracy. There's some, some testers out there that are very specific in terms of their accuracy only applies to specific rates. 
Um, and that can catch it off guard if your if your test step involves the rates that they're calling for a different accuracy. Look out for minimal minimum sample size required to meet the accuracy stated, and uh, of course, operating temperature specified specified for the test equipment. I want to thank everybody for uh, attending this webinar, and especially thank uh, Richard Griffin, the former director of Sutter Health Systems Clinical Technologies Department, for helping me out with looking at this from the biomed point of view, the, um, as well as our calibration partner, the metrology experts at Spectrum Technologies, were able to give us a ton of insight as well. And all of you biomedical engineers that are working hard every day to ensure the safety and accuracy of the patients as well as the medical devices they serve us. Thank you so much, Greg. We got a, a bunch of questions here. We're going to get right to it. Um, question one, who is a good resource to contact if I need help doing accuracy or uncertainty calculations between the medical device and test equipment? Um, I would suggest probably starting with your calibration lab because they're able to un untangle different specifications and how they relate uh, better than most. If um, Otherwise, you know, you can go back to the test equipment vendor and see if they can help you as well. Okay. Uh, question number two. Does the Flowtrax infusion pump tester give you a 4 to 1 ratio for volume and occlusion testing? Yes, it does. It took us a long time to get there, but we were able to achieve that four to one relationship between the, the te our tester and the different infusion pumps on the market. Okay, um, there are uh, some other questions that were submitted. They were kind of lengthy and were kind of technical, so we went ahead and forwarded those on to Pronk, and their uh, representatives will be replying back to those questions. So um, that kind of concludes today's webinar. We want to also mention if you're looking for more continuing education like today, the MD Expo Dallas is coming up this April and registration is open right now and you can use the Prompt VIP Pass included in your workbook for complimentary admission. You can visit mdexposhow.com for more information. So thank you again, Greg, and thank you again to today's sponsor, Prompt Technologies. Uh, one lucky attendee today will win lunch and Tech Nation t-shirts for their entire department. Details are included in the post-webinar survey, which will appear on your screen shortly. If you do not see the survey, email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. You must complete the survey to obtain your certificate of attendance. Thanks again for a fantastic kickoff to the 2016 Webinar Wednesday series. Hope you guys have a great rest of the day.